All right. So we are live. Hello, and welcome to MobLab Live session three of this year. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, so sorry that we were a bit late in starting this. Uh, one of our speakers, Professor Gordon, is facing some tech issues in joining the link. And hopefully, she should join us soon. Um, but without wasting any more time, I just thought we'll get started with the session. Today, we'll be talking about uh, <gasps> Yay! That was it! Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm so sorry. It was the browser. <laughs> so we are we are on air right now, and as everyone can see, the excitement that we have Professor Gordon with us and all the speakers, and including me, I'm super happy. Uh, so we'll be talking about uh, practicing self care and activism, uh, self care and collective well being and activism. And we have an incredible panel of speakers with us, um, and I'll introduce them shortly. But before that, if you want to start introducing yourself on the chat room, uh, your name, organization, where you're from, please feel free to do that. Um, and um, I'll also briefly run you through how the session will happen. So say about uh, the initial half of the session, we'll be talking with the different speakers, starting with a generic conversation, and then go deep into each of the speakers' work. Um, in the later half of the session, we will take questions from the audience, um, and you can write your questions on the YouTube chat room, uh, as well as you can tweet to us. Um, and our team who are monitoring the chat room and the Twitter account will source those questions to us. So please um, do that. And I welcome all the speakers who have joined us today from different regions and different time zones. Um, welcome, Susan. Welcome, ladies. And welcome, Professor Gordon. I'm so happy, uh, finally, we are able to join and, um, and without any tech issues, hopefully. Um, let me tell you a bit, little bit more about speakers, and then we'll straight away dive into the topic. Uh, Ladies is advocacy officer at Frida Young Feminist Fund. Um, she's a digital activist and specialist in feminist international Colombia, uh, political economy from um, Bogota, Colombia. She has also studied international relations at the University of Edinburgh and has a master's degree in international critical theory from the University of Exeter. And um, we are looking forward to hear the work that Frida Young Feminist Fund has been able to do on self-care and collective well-being, um, uh, as well as um, the work that they have been able to do with um, the grantees uh, of their own organization. We also have Professor Hava Gordon with us. Um, professor Gordon is the associate professor at the University of Denver. She specializes in the social construction of inequalities, such as gender, race, and especially on, uh, you know, she has done a lot of work on um, youth culture, uh, youth role of youth uh, in political movements. Um, and that is the subject of, of her uh, book, We Fight to Win, Inequality and the Politics of Youth Activism. Um, so we are looking forward to learn from her in terms of what does research talk about self-care and collective well-being um, in activism space and um, how, you know, how, how are youth political movements shaping up. We also have Susan Comfort. Um, she, Susan has been hooked on uh, social change since first learning how mess up our planet is. She has since then uh, worked with a lot of nonprofits, free campaigns, boards, uh, and other advocates and leaders on helping them think through wellness and self-care. Um, and, and, uh, and we are hoping to learn from her experience on how uh, organiza other organizations and movements have been adapting uh, practice and culture of uh, self-care and well-being. So on that note, um, we'll get started. And I'm going to pass this to speakers in a bit. Uh, but I want to quickly um, talk about why we thought this session is important and this topic is important for us. Because last year at one of our annual Skillshare gatherings, Campaign Con, where more than 120 activists from different parts of the globe um, gathered, and self-care came up as a very important topic um, you know, in, the, in the discussion. And there were a lot of uh, thoughts and questions being exchanged on the transformative potential uh, of self and collective care, but also profound difficulties and challenges um, that activists face in their daily lives to actually put this into practice. So how can we negotiate, um, you know, how can self-care be negotiated with family responsibilities? How can it be, how can we see it when we are working with victims of violence and oppression? 
how can we learn to prioritize self-care over deadlines? Uh, and how can we deal with uh, self-care when organizational and movement set, set up um, also have sexist and uh, racist hierarchies? The topic isn't new, uh, yet taking care of ourselves um, in our lives um, and movements still does not come easy. So on that note, um, I'm going to begin uh, the conversation with different speakers. Um, and uh, just to develop some shared understanding of uh, self-care in activism, uh, maybe um, Susan, uh, Professor Gordon, ladies, I will start uh, with uh, all of you and maybe just like a rapid fire um, round around just quick thoughts around how do you look at self-care and well-being in activism and why do you think we need to talk about it now? So maybe we'll start with uh, you, Susan. Sure, so sure. My, so, my, oh no, there's, oh no, feedback. there's feedback. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great. It's just that everyone has always been super stressed out doing this work. And I've done nonprofit work for 25 years. It's sort of built into our systems and we need to build it out of our systems, but that's a longer term conversation in the short term. We have pressures right now that we've never faced before. And so we're now at a point, sort of 18 months after a change in administration, especially here in DC, where folks are, are you know, at the burnout and the breaking point. And so now is when a lot of folks are starting to talk about it because it's really becoming visible. Um, recruitment and retention are huge issues in nonprofits. And, you know, self-care is something that is left up to ourselves because it's not part of our system. So I hope, you know, some of our conversation today can be how do we take care of ourselves and take that responsibility, but also how do we pass it on to the system so that it's built in like it is in some other systems, but not for some reason nonprofit work, even though we're taking care of society. Thank you, Susan. Um, Professor Gordon, what do you think? Uh, I think that self-care and collective care are vital to movements. And I think in academia, it's a really understudied topic. Um, we don't have a lot of researchers studying self-care as a, as a political action or a, as something that sustains movements. But certainly um, when activists burn out, um, not only activists' lives and trajectories, but also the organizations they work for and the broader movements they work for, for are put in jeopardy. So I think it's a tremendous importance. Thank you, Professor Gordon. Uh, ladies, let's hear from you. Yeah, um, I think from the perspective of Frida um, and us, as we have been working on it, is also like seeing self-care as more than just like a buzzword and really contextualizing it in the lives of activists, particularly young feminist activists in our case. So. Um, one of the things that, that, that we look at is holistic security. So how can we ensure um, the physical, digital, and like emotional and psychological safety of activists in order for them to do their work effectively, you know? And the role that funders and the philanthropy has in supporting this work because it's not only ignored in academia, it's also ignored in like, in funding, no, it's the work that people just put to the side. I mean, not only in our own lives, but also like just in general in sustaining the movement, because there's also a sense of urgency in 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 in, in constantly in other spaces, no. But people around us are um, burning out. They are leaving activism, particularly young feminists, because they um um they don't have access to like uh, living wages they don't have access to uh, something that can sustain them into activism is usually something that they do on the side um and so um they leave and and and, and so the question that, that that we're asking is how how can we sustain this in a way that is like ensuring that they are safe to do this online and to do this physically mm. thank you ladies i think that's um that's very interesting, and I think some of the common threads that came up in all the responses of um, you know Susan, Professor Gordon, and ladies Hugh are saying is that uh, you know it's uh, it's not even ignored in academia um, on you know organizations, movements, as well as like you know generally funding and everywhere, um, and it's such an important thing to talk about. 
I would also love to hear from you in terms of what what do you think? Because you've worked with so many different groups, movements, and organizations, um, and as well as like you know, um, with different researchers. I'm sure, Professor Gordon, what do you think prevents organizations, movements, and activists to actually practice it? Like, what are some of the common things that you think you see have come up? Mm. Um, maybe, ladies, do you want to start, and then we can shift to. Gordon and Susan. You know, I think this is when the feminist perspective is super valuable here because um like I think I think that there is a sense like what um the yeah, what what was mentioned before that uh, we are taking care of the universe but we don't take care of ourselves because we are constantly putting we get constantly putting um you know the entire like system like changing the system before our own well-being which I think is like a personal choice, which is the hard part here, right? Like, it's like uh, we um, we can sorry, sorry sorry we can we can um, yeah we can we can put like a lot of policies and we can like say like hey you have to leave work at five and people sometimes just don't right they just choose not to and and so like I think that there is there is a matter of like a reflection and a, and a, and a shift in our habits and our own perspective here that is really really crucial to what we are doing and then I think the perspective that I that I will share later also is the perspective of healing and how and the role that healing has in this in this work because we can't take care of others when we're broken ourselves so so we need to like understand like how can we heal in order to move to to also move forward no Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Professor Gordon. Uh, yeah, I think you asked what what inhibits organizations from yeah. um, prioritizing self care, and I think um, some of it is the moment we live in that the need for change is so urgent and so necessary. And I think um, there might be uh, an attitude on the part of organizations or individual activists that there's no time for this kind of work. Um, for self-care, sometimes we miss that the the battle is a long one. And if we look back at the history of social movements, movements have long arcs and they go on forever and they have victories and defeats. And um, I think we lose that long timeline of movements. And in the in the pursuit of urgent change, we forget that we have to take care of each other and ourselves to make it um, last and to make the victories last. Right. Susan. What do you think? Oh, gosh, I think so many things. The, the excuse that people give for not taking the time or investing the money is we don't have any time and we don't have any money um, for this, right? But we all have the same amount of time and some of us have different levels of money. And, you know, corporations actually get investing in their workers and it's not out of the like bountifulness and goodness of their hearts. It's because they know that they'll retain a healthier worker, they'll get more out of a healthier worker, or they'll keep somebody who they cook for at the office longer or whatever. We don't have that ethic of either level, you know, at the nonprofit space, but it's often no time, no money, right? But I think that's a false excuse. Really, we don't have the culture of self-care. We have the culture of martyrdom. We have the culture of mission. We have the culture of true believers and investing our blood, sweat, and tears, not our, I mean, our money in terms of like deferred pay and you know, like the female pay gap is nothing. There's a nonprofit pay gap on top of that, right? So we have a culture of self-denial and that spreads into self-care. It also makes for very bad habits of management in the workplace. You get to leadership in this movement. And I know, you know, from being like an achieving, like hard driving manager and then your people are burned out and they don't want to be that kind of leader. So they're like, oh, I don't, leadership in the nonprofit movement, that's not for me. So again, retention and recruitment, retention and recruitment, um, it's not part of our culture yet. And it needs to be because even corporations are getting it. Come on. PricewaterhouseCoopers just gave $1,000 unlimited wellness bonus to every single employee. That's, about, you know, just for wellness, right? They get it. We don't get it. I don't know why, but we don't. Right. And I think that, that sort of brings us to a very interesting point that um, everyone uh, the panel has shared. Like, it is, like, let's dig deep into what actually builds this culture. What do we know about 
um, you know, the culture we live in, in terms of like organizations and movements or, or, or even like how it translates to individual activists not prioritizing self-care. Um, so I'm going to start with um, all, of, all of the different speakers one by one. And I want to invite Professor Gordon first. Uh, um, and Professor Gordon, you have done some uh, incredible amount of research on, um, you know, in terms of the role of youth and social movements, uh, youth politics and culture. Um, can you sh please share a bit more about about your work in the light of what does research say about self-care and well-being within activism and movement space? And what have you found, like any key insights, key um, lessons that you have found? Yeah, well, so a few things. As I mentioned before, it's been a really understudied element, I think, of movements, because most people focus on um, how movements get resources, how they leverage political effectiveness, um, how they take advantage of political opportunities. But I think also um, what we know is that movements also prefigure the world in which they're trying to live, the, the world they're fighting for. And so if movements don't prefigure that, if they don't practice those ethics within their movement, um, they're not going to sustain themselves. They're kind of going to fall into a hypocrisy that causes a strain between the world we're fight they're fighting for and their organizational dynamics. So to some degree, I think um, self-care and collective care is a way of prefiguring the world that we're fighting for. And it's, it's important to sustain the group, um, the group momentum. So I have two strains of research. I've um, looked at youth activism. I've done a comparative look at um, youth activists that organize in youth only spaces versus spaces with adult allies. And then I've also looked at um, youth activism in terms of burnout. So um, when youth activists become paid workers in nonprofit organizations, um, why do sometimes they burn out and, and end up leaving those movements? Um, so I'll talk about the, the first study. And what I found is that um, the, the youth that get together as youth only, oftentimes they do so because they don't have adult allies they can depend on. Um, and so, and maybe this kind of goes to other elements of activism as well, that the absence of allies can also accelerate burnout. Um, so one way of taking care of ourselves, I think, is to understand where we can leverage allies to do some of the work that we're trying to do. Um, not to position allies as the most important part of movements, but to strategically kind of make sure that they can interface with other powerful people um, or, or kind of do their work outside of the movement in, in service of the movement. That's really important. So allyship is a really important way, I think, of collective self-care. Um, I think also um, the movements I've seen work very well, and especially youth movements that have adult allies in them, is that they focus on political education and political history. So they take time out to um, study past movements and study some of their tactics um, and the long arc of organizing to understand that maybe a, an immediate defeat won't, um, won't be the end of their activism. Because I think as sometimes we go into activism wanting um, immediate change. You know, we want to see our, the fruits of our labor come to fruition right away. And I think those activists that take time to study political history um, can understand that that things take a long time and that little setbacks don't necessarily mean the end of activism. So that's a way of taking our, our care of ourselves as well. Um, also, I think movements that um, practice collective self-care are those that um, talk about their tensions openly in some kind of caring strategic way. And I think that's another pitfall that uh, groups fall into is that they might have tensions around sexism, racism, um, other inequalities, and they don't prioritize stopping for a moment to understand their internal dynamics. And that's a mistake because that will burn out um, the especially um, marginalized uh, members of the group. Mm -hmm. So that's really important as well. Um, and I think also activists need to take time to um, integrate play into their movement organizations, to integrate fun, um, to integrate education. Um, we, are, we are people who do a lot of different things in our lives. We are family members, we are friends, and to make those part of our political lives is very important. So I would say that's, that's um, one piece of it. 
Um, and I would also say that I, I think um, I, I think as Susan was discussing about the nonprofit structure itself, there's an ethic of kind of um, martyrdom and almost you have to get close to the edge of burning out in order to be an effective activist. And I think that's what I find a lot of youth who um, grow in youth movement organizations and then go on to want to build a career in those organizations. They find that there's a tension sometimes between the work they want to do on the ground and the funding they get in the organization. And so um, sometimes they have to do the work they care about maybe off the clock or around the grant. And that means they end up doing 80 hour work weeks and, um, and burning themselves out. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what um, you briefly, I think touched on it in terms of like tensions around um, sexism, um, racism and not being able to address that. And I would love to dive a little deep on that. Uh, what, like, you know, just understanding a little bit more around, like, what role does, you know, and what and how, like, uh, you know, structural inequalities like age, race, class, gender, you know, plays um, in building a cul culture of collective well being. So if a team is really diverse, um, do you think? The struggles mm -hmm. are more, or, or how, like, and if there are any lessons or examples that you have where diversity has caused any, you know, different way of looking at self care, or the team has struggled a little more because of the diversity. How, how do you look at it? Yeah, well, I think one issue, and ladies can certainly speak to this, is that the again, girls, I think especially, are socialized to be the caretakers, um, to put other people first. So when you have that already coming into a mixed gender organization, um, then that means that girls or women might take on some of the grunt work of the uh, activism or the organizing, while the boys kind of become the central players or the stars or the main um, faces of the movement. And that can certainly be um, a huge tension right there. Um, and then of course, also, if you're battling inequalities within your movement, you're going to be burned out. You're spending your energy and resources battling racism and sexism within the movement, movement and also battling the forces outside of the movement. Um, so if you're, it, it's kind of a, a tax and emotional labor on, um, you know, people of color, on girls, on young people to have to constantly educate other people in the movement to see them as um, equals, then um, that's then that's a, a burden put on those those folks, and will end up as kind of pushing them out of the movement, which is a very dangerous thing. Right. Okay. Thank you, Professor Gordon. I think we'll uh, and we'll come back to you because I'm sure uh, audience would have some follow up questions on um, you know the work that you have shared and other lessons that you have shared from your research and experience. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to uh, Ladies uh, from Frida Young Feminist Fund. Um, Ladies, Frida has done some great work on actually building organizational culture on self care and well being, and you've, you've been working very closely with your grantees as well. Um, can you share a bit more about your work? How, like, how have you done it, and what are the main lessons if someone wants to center self care and well being, collective well being within organizational strategy and culture? Yeah. Um, so, like I said, we um, we start from a holistic security perspective. So we are incorporating like digital security capacity building into our work. Um, and so like so we are like investing a lot of time in learning how to care for ourselves virtually. Um, and to how to be safe and creating those protocols in order for the people who interact with us to be safe as well. Um, then on the other hand, um, so we are also, talk we also uh, did a process called the Happiness Manifesto, which is like, uh, we got together and sort of listed the things that we already do like ourselves, where we are already noticing that we're not practicing, you know, care. So for example, like, I don't know, I forget to have lunch. So, or I don't often have lunch in front of my lap, or I work after 7 p.m., whatever. Mm. And from that, we um, created agreements and said, okay, now I my agreement is to have lunch 
and eat at proper times. Um, and then those agreements became collective agreements. So not only they came from us, like from our personal practices, but then everyone is sort of like held collectively to them. So um, we have a thing called the Happiness Manifesto. Um, and we try to hold each other to those agreements. The Happiness Manifesto um, talks about three levels of care, which is what we usually use. So the three levels of care are like individual. So the practices you have for yourself, so like eating, sleeping, um, then the organizational, which is like your policies and the institutional practices that already exist. Um, so some of the things that we did from from the organizational perspective was to um, like to say, okay, every time you travel, you can have a, a you need to have proper rest to sleep. So that's part of like your like our organizational policy. So you can you can so that's a commitment that can be made organizationally. And then we have another dimension, which is anyone who interacts with us. So like grantees, partners, um, activists. Um, and there we really want to make sure that also like, you know, the earth and other living beings are included. Um, and not only that, we are practicing care for ourselves like um, as humans. So like, you know, going to get massages or whatever, like that we're also considering how we are caring for the environment and how on the earth. Um, as well as a, anyone who comes into contact with us. So, for example, one of the things that we do from that perspective is like never, if we are asking someone to come and speak in an event uh, uh, based on our invitation, like not ask them to come, I don't know, to arrive at 6 a.m. so that they start up at 9 a.m. or like something like that. that we're like, no, like if you're coming to come to talk to us, then you have to arrive. At, you know, you, your flight has to be comfortable, things like this. Like we just have to make sure that anyone who is, a part of our our community is also cared for by our practices right now we only have the happiness manifesto uh, we're still not live yet and we're still working on it but um we really encourage other organizations to create something like that that works for your needs because feed as a specific organization we're all young feminists we're all from the global south um and we all work in specific contexts right like care just doesn't mean the same thing in right. Colombia, it means in, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, so um, we really encourage people to, to, to take this into account and just like accommodate to their context because it's like a really good exercise. For example, like I'll finish with this. If my colleagues see me working at like 8 p.m., they're like, what are you doing here? Like, <laughs> and they like make sure, like it's tough love, but we're like making sure that each of us are like, don't email when you're on vacation, you know, like right. holding each other accountable to this. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Thanks, uh, ladies. And um, and I think uh, you brought out a very important point. And I'm sure you know this. This question might be in every you know a lot of people's mind because um, a lot of us work in like really remote teams, um, very distributed teams uh, who don't really you know meet each other in person very often. Um, and so, do you have any ex you know lessons or experience to share in terms of how do you actually scale anything that you're planning as a team in terms of look so that it gets distributed to each and every uh space uh where your team is working and and how do you sustain it because um because coming up with practices and agreements sometimes when um deadlines and other stuff or anything else gets uh, serious then it just like vanishes and 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 then maybe it's very difficult to pick that up uh so any any lessons or uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think sometimes this self care thing can also become another uh, another same standard by which activists measure ourselves up against. And we're like, we're not good enough, you know. Like sometimes it's like we, we like <laughs> guilt ourselves and we're like, no, I'm not taking care of myself. Like I really need to go and like and like look, I'm still on my computer and. I think it's really important that this doesn't become another source of stress and that you know if you are passionate or you have a deadline or you go up there or there's something that you specifically want to invest your time and energy on and that might mean that for that time time are investing this and this then it makes sense. it makes sense. But but like like just, just like like the like I think oh, sorry I'm just like getting feedback and like I was fine okay no <laughs> um, 
yeah, I think in general, like, um, it just comes to personal choice. And that I think is a really hard one because the Frida, we have, we not only did have a half a billion manifesto, we also have changed our, hum our, re our human resources, like policies, the hours we work, how long, like, it's just really specified. So now basically it's like us <laughs> jumping into this opportunity and figuring out what life looks like when you don't have enough time to do everything you said you thought you thought you could do and when you have to stop because you have to go for a jog or something or because you have to stop because you want to go for an ice cream and i think it's it's also figuring what that practice looks like in your own personal life mm -hmm. um but yeah we, we still have a long way to go and we definitely don't practice everything that we say um, so I just want to mention that too, because we're not in any way sort of um, suggesting that we're like perfect or something, <laughs> like that we're practicing this and we're all caring for ourselves now. These are all, these are just our efforts. Right. Um, thanks, Ladies. And I, I think um, once we've heard from Susan, I'd love to come back to you in terms of, uh, you know, a lot of, you work with a lot of grantees, so maybe any successful examples of how you're actually translating this culture to your grantees. Um, it would be great to hear on that front too. For now, I'm going to move to Susan. Um, and Susan, uh, can you like you work with so many different organizations um, across you know over over the span of like more than 25 years? Uh, can you share some examples of systems, processes, tools, etc., that are working for organizations and groups to build this as part of their org strategy and culture? Absolutely. There's so many things that organizations can do and are doing for free that work for their employees. And it's out of necessity, right? You know, you go, well, we don't have any money. What can we do with no money? That's the mother of invention. And so, you know, nonprofits are great at things like flexible work scheduling. You know, we, we are good at letting people work from home on Fridays or, you know, commute by commute in and flex their hours or that kind of thing. Um, understanding you know your coworkers' needs we're good at that having happy hours we're good at that i actually did a survey at the end of last year a nonprofit burnout prevention survey where i asked folks you know what are what is your nonprofit good at where could it use some work and you know we're we're good at flexible work hours and we're good at happy hours <laughs> we can use work pretty much everywhere else um you know and the work that i do operates on the very short that i do operates on the very short term and the kind of short term and then the longer term on the very short term, I do talks all the time about taking five minute breaks. Like at least you can take a five minute break and just leverage those five minutes as best you can. And my talk is about, you know, incorporating play into it, like Hava was saying, and making it very personal to you. Like Ladies was saying, like your play is another person's torture. So you have to like take responsibility for your own wellness and your own what's going to restore you. Um, but there's also the brain science and just the common sense of how you take a break that's more restorative, like how you can actually use that five or 10 minutes to greater effect for your brain and for your body. Um, so we talk about that. So that's a really like short term thing you can do is take a better break, you know, even if it's a short one um, or just take one in general. People died for your breaks. You know, I talk about Frances Perkins and how she witnessed the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire which happened because the doors were locked because they didn't let women take breaks in those days. It was a sweatshop and they had to work from seven to eight with a half hour lunch break. So, you know, uh, Frances Perkins became the first secretary, woman secretary of labor, the longest serving secretary of labor ever. And, you know, put in a lot of worker protections. So, um, so folks died for our breaks. We should at least take them. And then longer term, you know, culturally, like you said, um, a project that we have to have cultures of well-being in organizations and some of the things that I've seen work are, you know, things where the person in charge of people, maybe that's the ED, maybe there is an HR person that they have to really like take care of. They have to care about the person, the people's health in general and individually, and they have to care about the team. My premise is you can use personal wellness to get to team health, but that's a different like thread of conversation. Um, but generally, like if the if the head person like takes good care of themselves or is physically healthy, or you know is is in a good place and cares about their workers, is an empathetic person, like they're going to care about the health of their workers. And then if you bring common sense policies, like hey, when we travel, we should build in an extra day for rest, or we should have you know sensible pay policies, or we should whatever the, the common sense thing is, then your leader is gonna be empathetic and say yes. But 
as I've said before, like Hava was talking about, you can be like a meditating marathoner, but if you go to work and you're harassed, that's not going to be a great place for you. So we have to take care of team health as well as all the physical and mental health interventions that we so desperately need and can't afford usually. Um, so the last thing I'll just mention, and we can dig into whichever thread you want, is on the kind of longer short term, um, we're running a pilot uh, over the six month time period of August to January with nonprofit workers here in DC, where we'll test mental and physical and team health um, benefits like physical health, the things that are in the lead off the applications are, um, you know, physical health coaching and classes, but also nutrition counseling. And um, what's the other physical health thing that people want? Uh, oh, ergonomics at work, like advice on standing desks and things. And then in the mental health category, folks want mindfulness, of course, but they also want um, financial health information. They want, uh, you know, team health and, and, you know, ways that we work together kind of interventions. And um, you know, even spiritual support for, for folks, spiritual practices, because that's a great source of wellness and self-care. Um, but we're going to use it as a sneaky way to get to team health, you know, so we'll do group things, group physical health things. Yeah. But also mental health things around finances and uh, meditation and what I call right brain therapy, you know, exposure to the arts and things like that. And, um, you know, Frida, I love that happiness manifesto. Uh, I think that's a, that's something that every organization should kind of figure out instead of ground rules we'll just do a happiness manifesto at the beginning of every meeting or retreat that's so true and uh, just to follow up on that susan i think um i think you mentioned uh, to me when we were chatting before uh, that you have developed uh, um, a sort of like top 10 things that the organizations can do for free um, in order to actually start building this culture in their work. Uh, do we want to share a bit more about that? Because I think I'm, I'm very curious to learn about that and I'm sure um, participants will really value that. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm honestly, the only thing that's holding me up in like getting that out is that it looks, to, it's just like a typed up document. It didn't, like, I'm terrible with graphics. So I'm just waiting on someone <laughs> to kind of lay it out. But it's, um. Yeah, the things that, that organizations can do for free, I mean, we touched on some of them, like, you know, have flexible work schedules, have a notch down dress policy. Like if people are comfortable and able to move around or by commute or not have dry cleaning bills, you know, they're happier. If you can do, I recommend like do it yourself PD where, you know, folks have skills to offer at your office. Maybe it's not like the skills of the work, but maybe it's not like regression analysis, but maybe it's, why we should or shouldn't have a vlog, or maybe it's like the best things about the Black Panther movie that you should know, or, you know, there are lots of things that people can give workshops on in your office. Um, what is CrossFit anyway? And you can, you know, do a rotating, like do it yourself PD where you have brown bag lunches and people have little mm -hmm. like how to knit a beanie, whatever people <laughs> want to share, you know, their talents. Um, so there are things like that that improve our mental health, you know, force us to get together as a community. Um, you know, we share personal, but like non threatening things about each other. And then we come together as a team. So it's this sneaky, like using mental and physical health stuff for team health um, mm -hmm. strategy that I want to, to get out there in the nonprofit world. Awesome. Thank you, Susan. Um, and for the for everyone who has joined the conversation, I want to let you know that uh, there are a few resources. Um, you know, you know the speakers are mentioning on the session right now. We will also share it with you uh, as we put together the blog recap post. Um, and whatever Susan is just talking about, if it's just a typed out uh, document, not very fancy, it's going to be fine. There, I'll put it up at nonprofitcomfort.com after this call. It'll look terrible, but I'll put it up. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, and so we have um, we are opening this uh, next 10 minutes to audience questions. So please, um, if you have any follow up questions or any other specific questions that you want to ask to any particular speaker, please type that out on the YouTube chat room uh, and we'll get that um, get those addressed to the speakers. Uh, meanwhile, I'm, I'm going to come back to you, Professor Gordon. Um, I know you have uh, done some amount of work and you have written something about burnouts. Um, and uh, this was one of the questions that came up uh, in our registration form. From, uh, it's from Kylie from USA. Uh, what are some of the warning signs of burnouts that organizations and group need to know of? 
Mm, that's a great question. What are the warning signs? Uh, I think, uh, I hope with activists, activists are a vocal bunch usually. Um, and so I think um, maybe one of the warning signs is that you might have a group of activists in the organization that have been vocal about an issue, but they're not, um, they're not really listened to by leadership. For example, if the if the organization especially is a somewhat hierarchical, um, that can be, I think, a precursor to burnout. Um, but other warning signs maybe are when you see activists working late at night, habitually. Um, uh, the, I think that's a warning sign as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe folks have other warning signs, but. Um, when you see the hardest workhorses in the organization, those are the folks who are not going to make it, I think, for the long haul. Right. Uh, Susan, ladies, anything that you want to share in terms of um, warning signs for burnouts? Um, yeah, like, when well, something that I have always seen is like, um, like smoking sometimes is a big is a big uh, it's a big like teller for me like if there's if there's excessive smoking I'm like okay something's happening um I also missing deadlines dropping balls frequently like uh, being like I didn't realize because I was focused on this um uh, also like um because uh, there's just so much on your plate that you like there's just like specific details like not attention to detail that happened to me a lot before. Um, but I also think like, um, it all, like one of the biggest things for me is like maybe not seeing friends and like, like really focusing on work, like not having activities outside of work is usually also like one of the, one of the, one of the, the things that I'm like, maybe you're prioritizing and you're not, and you're saying no to friends and you're saying no to any other activity that maybe engages you in a different perspective on your work. Um, yeah, I would add that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just chime in. Uh, Letty said a lot of the practical uh, and individual signs, and I'll just point out that this term burnout, when I was growing up, it meant that it was somebody who smoked too much pot, but then Herbert Freudenberger, who is a psychologist in New York City, published using the term burnout in 1974, and then um, there was a much more popular article that used it in 1976, so it became part of the lexicon, and then uh, burnout became its own medical condition. Like there's a, what's it, the ICM? Um, there's a 10, there's a medical condition for burnout. But point being that burnout is usually characterizing a loss of passion as well as that depleted physical thing, right? It's not that you're working too hard at the widget factory because you don't really care about widgets. Mm -hmm. It's that you were passionate about this thing. Maybe it's a world changing thing. Um, maybe it's a work thing, right? You were passionate about this thing and you had this passion that drove you and then you lost it. And so when I see like, when you say like, what are the signs of burnout? Like technically it's like when you lose that passion and there's so many individual signs of that, but I just think about like how much more productive we could be as a sector or how much more productive I am as an individual when I'm like super passionate and engaged and feeling like I'm firing on all cylinders, yeah. you know, professionally, but also physically like, okay, I got this, you know, I'm energetic. And like, wouldn't every nonprofit leader want their people to be like that, you know, like super motivated and physically like able to do the work and show up and give, you know, a hundred percent. So again, it's uh, that, that burnout, it's almost like it's too late. Like you've lost the passion if you're already burned out. So you got to look for those warning signs that Ledis was talking about before you get to that point. Right. Well, okay, so uh, thank you uh, everyone for sharing that. I think that takes us also to our second question um, in terms of, and this has come from, on the chat from Meg, Meg, Meg Pitti. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, um, but there were a couple of questions uh, from Zavadia and Meg Pitti on the same lines. Uh, Professor Gordon, you mentioned about uh, what defines an ally to help avoid burnout in youth. Uh, so the question is, how can we add? A, how can we as adults be better allies to youth, and how mm -hmm. can how can we encourage more intergenerational learning and experience sharing? 
Mm. Well, that's a great question too. Um, I would say, um, first, I think adults have to be aware that there is something called adultism, that it's a real thing. And even if all youth end up growing up uh, to become adults, it doesn't mean there's not a systemic inequality there. So I think any adults who work with youth have to be willing to recognize that it happens um, in organizational levels, institutional, but also interpersonal and be willing to work with youth to disrupt that when it's happening. Um, the best youth activism, the most sustainable that I've seen is when youth um, work with adults and constantly open those conversations about adultism. So when they might facilitate a workshop or do an action, they'll always debrief afterwards and youth will be able to call adults out on their adultism and say, in that moment, I felt like this. And I think what I was witnessing was adultism. And then the adult can say, you're right. I'm next time. I'm really not going to do that. I'm sorry. Um, but to have a space for those kind of intergenerational conversations as they're happening in real time is really helpful. So debrief workshops, I think, um, even though they're small, there can be really important to keep a check on processes. Mm -hmm. uh, Susan, do you have any response on the same question? I love that idea about debrief workshops, but I think, you know, debriefing can and, and should just be a quick response, you know, can be part of the culture, right? I, I debrief, you know, when you're in the elevator after a meeting, as long as there's nobody else in the elevator, uh, you know, and, and it can really powerfully address the power dynamic because if the boss is saying to someone who came to the meeting with them, um, who maybe didn't even speak that much in the meeting, if the boss said, what could I have done better? Or what really landed with you? Um, then the boss gets really good feedback if the person's honest and like that person feels part of the team. Mm -hmm. um, and there may or may not be a, a culture like Hava describes where the person could say, I feel that you were being adultist or I felt that was uh, you know, a very gendered, you know, <laughs> situation or whatever it might be, that depends on the culture of the organization. Um, and, you know, again, I think issues of self-care are at once very personal, but like we can let people in on whatever level we want, right? I let people know that I'm into yoga because I always want to have conversations about mm -hmm. yoga, right? Um, but I don't, talk often about like alcohol use or why I gave it up because like that's a sensitive issue for some people and I don't necessarily want to go there you know in terms of sharing my own story or whatever yeah. but you can let people in on whatever level you want so therefore self-care can be something you can reinforce in the workplace and you can be like hey I'm trying to drink more water will you remind me to drink eight glasses of water and that's a wellness thing that we can safely communicate about in the workplace, or we can be like, haha, I'm going to the bathroom so much, I walked by your desk so many more times. We know each other better now. That's a safe thing for us to talk about. But I can let people into whatever level I want. Right. Um, and again, if we're all being exposed to new things, like one of the top vote getters in my team health applications for this wellness pilot is people want tasting parties for vegetable juices and protein juices, you know, all these juice places that are coming up. Uh, they want to market to new customers and uh, they, you know, we want to taste juices together. Um, it doesn't have to be like workouts. Um, people want to have gardening how-to discussions and, you know, financial health conversations, which again can be free. Like you can get your retirement plan guy or woman to come back in and talk to you about financial savings. So there's a lot of ways that we can use mental and team health again to build, I'm sorry, mental and physical health to build team health in the workplace. Um, but we have to recognize that like, it's intimate, it's personal, but we care about each other and that's why we're talking about it. Right. That's, I think that's a very important point you mentioned, um, Susan. Um, I have a couple of more questions uh, because we have only six minutes left before we uh, close this session. So I'm, uh, and those questions are for um, ladies, you. Um, one is, could you say, um, uh, I, I think it's from Ellison Mills, uh, she is asking you, could you say more about what do you mean by digital care? Uh, and the second question is from, um, from Romy, uh, how to raise the issue with our grantee organization, how to have meaningful conversation around this issue during update calls? Um, so 
Do you want to comment, call, you know, share your thoughts on those two questions one by one quickly, maybe? Yeah. Um, what we mean by digital care, um, we have a, well, we have um, increased our capacity on understanding what threats we are basically exposed to when we are engaging in virtual work and in virtual activism. And understanding that has also led us to understand how, like the context that we're in, so the technopolitical context we exist in, and how to respond to that effectively. So it's not that we, for example, all of a sudden stopped using Google and it all shut down our Facebook accounts or something like that, but that we're now more aware of like what information we're sharing in what spaces about whom, especially our grantees who, who are young feminists, in often very hostile um, and um, yeah, like just very like, um, they're, you know, not very, no, I don't want to say free, but like there's just hostile and oppressive context where they're surveilled, where they are followed, where they are being recorded. And so our responsibility here is to handle this information safely and ensure that other people are aware of the same threats and that they're also responding in the same ways. So sometimes it's something that is really practical, like, okay, we all need to download this app and we are now going to communicate around this on this app. Other times it's actually like, actually I'm from this region and in this region things like this happen. So how can I uh, safely, um, you know, communicate, travel, do do things um, online? Um, so it depends, you know, it's sometimes very wide, also sometimes very detailed. Um, so that's what we mean by digital care. And it is really important because um, as young as activists, particularly young feminists, uh, face a lot of uh, online harassment and online um, uh, bullying. And and uh, so it's not necessarily that it happens on the street. Um, so we were responding to this threat. And then the other question was about, um, sorry, I forgot the other question. Yes, yeah, so it was about how to how do you raise the issue with the grantees? Bueno, in our case, we have we we sort of raise it in a way that is like learning from their practices, really. As a funder, there's also an effort of decolonizing like care. So we are under like like a lot of young feminists are rescuing ancestral healing practices from their communities, and they are putting this you know, in practice within their uh, activisms and making this part of their activisms. And so we, we want to learn from these practices really um, and, in, and then share them with uh, the rest of the community and the rest of the particularly philanthropic community. Um, so we are engaging our, our, our grantees in this way, but another, another way in which we have engaged our grantees and other, our grantees and other institutional partners uh, is uh, with um, the Urgent Action for Latin America, who have been leading this work immensely, and they have done an incredible work on on self care and care and, and and centering care within philanthropy and within our movements of the feminist movement. Um, they they we we developed with them like a quiz style test where you can where you can introduce this uh, reflection with your peers and then have a discussion about what it feels like to answer this test. And this test covers like the individual, organizational um, and community levels. And we will share it after, but it's, it's a good tool to start this conversation. Awesome. Thank you, ladies. Um, and thank you for that. We are, we are running over to, uh, I mean, we are very close to uh, getting the session time over. So I'm going to just do a clo uh, closing rapid fire. Um, and my question to all of you is, what would be your top advice, tip, or any tool that you would recommend to people so that self-care and well-being becomes a practice in day-to-day -day life? So maybe we'll start with you, Professor Gordon. Ha! Huh, well, I keep thinking of the organizational level. So try to find ways to share responsibilities and duties and power in your group. Awesome. Ladies, what would be your tip or advice? Um, I, I think it would be hold each other accountable for like, uh, and if you notice that your, your peers are practicing like overwork or they're burning out, that you like have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. Susan. Mine is take two 
five minute breaks a day that you plan, that you plan and you don't skip them. But it's not the bathroom break, it's not the smoke break, it's not even the coffee break. These are like five minute breaks that you plan. You need advice, I'm happy to give it to you. Um, and yeah, at nonprofitcomfort.com, I'll post the 10 free things you can do to build your team health list. But my rapid fire thing is just take more breaks. Awesome. Thank you so much. And with that, we'll have to close this session. Um, I want to thank all our speakers, Professor Gordon, Susan, ladies. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this was an incredible conversation. I really enjoyed organizing and working with you to make this session happen. Uh, and to the audience, I'm sure this was as much fun as it was for all of us uh, who are on the session room. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and I know you all have prior commitments, so feel free to leave the conversation. Uh, I have a couple of more comments for our audience. So we will be sharing um, the video recording and the blog recap uh, in, a, in a week time with you. Um, if you have any more questions uh, for any of the speakers, please let us know. Um, we will try addressing them in the blog recap post. Um, and yes, with that, we will see you next time in the fourth Mob Live Live session next month in the month of June with hopefully a more interesting, another interesting topic and another bunch of uh, uh, speakers. So, um, well, okay, so good night. Have a good day, whichever time zone are you in. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.